yesterday we began with 15 teams and the competition was high. The presentations were sharp and on point and the judges were probing, I hear. Were they really? You think the judges were probing? Oh, I heard a yes there in the back. So all the projects were excellent, the business ideas, and I want to urge the founders, the advisors, the professors, and the mentors to keep at it. Job well done. Take the recommendations and the advice given by the judges and move your projects forward. Now today, we have a fresh canvas. We have six teams. Now, everybody can win, but I'm cheering you all on. I just want you to know I don't have any favorites yet. Now, you're going to be competing for national honors, cash prizes, and all-expense-paid trip to the International Business Model Competition to carry on the tradition which began in 2014 and to vigorously defend and bring back to Jamaica that beautiful trophy. Now you know it's coming back to Jamaica, right? I can't hear you. So we're bringing the trophy back to Jamaica? Thank you very much, just so everybody's on the same page. The global, the global sorry, champion trophy of the International Business Model Competition. Now, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to acknowledge and pay homage to our sponsors, IDB Lab. Thank you. Clap them, clap them, clap them, please. Please clap them. Panjam Investment. <laughs> NCB Foundation. GK Capital Management, the Musson Foundation, Scotia Bank, Burger King, the Sagicor Group, and the Petro Carib Development Fund. Thank you. Look how we're waking up together, and I feel like we're in the competitive spirit. But now I'm going to take a little rest from chit-chatting with you, but I'll be back. Don't worry. I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming Mrs. Audrey Richards. Now, she's the project coordinator at Jamaica Venture Capital Program at the Development Bank of Jamaica. Audrey leads a highly dedicated and hardworking team. If you met Audrey, you'd know Audrey, okay? And Audrey is all about hard work. So her hardworking team, it is under her portfolio that the NBMC falls. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, not just Audrey and her team in the VC unit, but indeed the wider DBJ family. We have to say thank you to all of you. You have supported and encouraged a tremendous work, and you have been facilitating economic growth and development for Jamaica and Jamaicans. So we all have to say a very special thank you. Lots of round of applause here. Come on. Come on, guys. We're awake. Everybody's blood sugar is up. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A very, very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, yes, as Rochelle just said, it's been six years, and um, I just want to say a big thank you and I give us so much credit to the students who have participated, the coordinators and coaches who have worked tirelessly with them over the years. Without your input, without your enthusiasm and commitment, we would not be here in the sixth year um, with so many people vying to, to be part of this competition. So thank you all and thank you and we look forward to, to this being another great competition today. Now, thank you also to our sponsors as they were just recognized and of course our judges and who will then, um, introduce shortly and um, of course I want to also give a shout out to my awesome team. So, ladies and gentlemen, we started with 15 yesterday, as Rochelle just said, and today we're down to six. I hope everybody had a good night's sleep and nobody was up until <laughs> Dr. Nathan. <laughs> that sounds like a little guilty laugh there. <laughs> so I hope you're all ready and rearing with the same energy that you came here with yesterday. So what we want to do now is to... Um, draw the order in which we're going to compete. So, I have a special fishbowl here. And um, our teams who are competing today, and in no special order, Prelab, Zermasol, Jacent, Redraft, Jamaica Bioplastics, or J Bioplastics, and C Squared ML. 
um, Pre-Lab from the UE, Zermasol from UTech, JSENT UTech, Redraft NCU, J Bioplastic UE, and C2, C Squared ML University of Technology. So I uh, placed um, in this fishbowl um, uh, the numbers one to six. So I'd now like to invite a representative from each, the, the founder of each team, to come forward to pull a number, because this, the number you pull will determine the order in which you present. So please, can I have a representative from each team? Repeat the order, please. C squared ML is up number one. Yeah. <laughs> number two, J Bioplastic. Number three, Prelab. Number four, Zermacell. Number five, JSENT. And number six, Redraft. Before the teams leave the room, I think we'll be hearing from Dr. Nathan with the rules. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Audrey. Everybody, can I get a round of applause for Audrey, please? Okay, so now we're gonna get into the rules and Dr. Carol Nathan is gonna come and give us the rules and the guidelines, but just a little bit about her. Dr. Nathan is a lecturer at the University of Technology, Jamaica. She is a team lead of UTEC's business model competition program. I heard some woo, woo, woo in the back there. Get loud, man, get loud, it's allowed, it's allowed. <laughs> Dr. Nathan will be sharing us the rules and guidelines of the competition, but before she comes to us, please allow me to acknowledge our other coordinators, Laura Lee Jones of Edna Manley College. <laughs> Hazel O'Connor of Northern Caribbean University. Go Hazel, I don't know you, but everybody likes you. Woo Ashley Rose Davis of UEMSBM. And of course, Novelette Cook and Frederick Mills, who support Dr. Nathan with the UTech program. Dr. Nathan. <laughs> We are off to an exciting start, and I can see that, and I know you're revving to go. But let us be guided again. We know you know it, but let us be guided again by the rules of the competition. The main objectives of the annual national business model competition is to promote and encourage entrepreneurial development at the tertiary level. The competition, now in its sixth year, offers a unique opportunity for students to put together entrepreneurial principles to practice through an integrated learning experience. It also provides linkages between budding entrepreneurs and private sector mentors and financiers and encourages students enrolled at the tertiary level institutions to create their own employment. Finally, the competition fosters and supports potential entrepreneurs towards economic growth and job creation. The following rules and regulations are established and agreed by the steering committee chaired jointly by the National Development Bank of Jamaica and the private sector organization of Jamaica and includes the coordinators from the respective universities. Specifically, each university will organize an internal competition between October and mid-February of each year. The fourth and up to, up to fifth place winners, top fourth up to fifth place winners from the universities will apply and participate in the national competition. Participants in the university's competition must be registered students in good and regular standing with their respective universities. The National Business Model Competition encourages team participation with a minimum of two to a maximum of five individuals. Wherever possible, teams are encouraged to use their best presenter to make the pitch. Student teams must own 
control of a minimum of 51% of the business. The venture, that's the business venture, cannot be a buyout or an expansion of an existing company. Investments of no more than 500,000 Jamaican dollars will be allowed from friends and family. And lastly, a business venture can only compete once in the national business model competition. However, team members may participate multiple times. So we are now clearer on exactly what are our rules governing this competition. Thank you very much. OK, I want to tell you who our judges are for today's final. First judge is Wayne Beecher. Second judge is Althea West Myers. And our final judge today is Douglas Robinson. So we're going to reconvene at 2 p.m. for awards presentation. And our guest speaker is going to be the Honorable Dr. Nigel Clark, Minister of Finance and the Public Service. But thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your continued support of this initiative and for your commitment to making a difference in Jamaica's future business leaders. So please join me in welcoming the first team today, C Squared ML. Are you tired of recurring yeast infections? Is bacterial vaginosis so frustrating? Has going to the doctor become more of a hindrance than a help? Well, we have the solution for you. At C Square ML Formula, your one stop shop, bacterial vaginosis, and yeast infection treatments. Now, ladies, I don't know if you've ever had a yeast infection or a bacterial vaginosis, but the pain, the itching, and don't get me started on those doctor's offices and pharmacy wait times. And on top of that, our Pharmacy Regulation Council has made it almost impossible for us to get over-the-counter treatments, thus forcing us to go the traditional route. Now, we have found 83% of Jamaican women last year contracted a yeast infection, and 21 million women in the United States contracted bacterial vaginosis in 2017. Thus, leading to our first and most critical assumption. These are our competitors. Ravishing Beauty is on the lower end of the spectrum. Monistat, a popular yeast infection treatment. Cookie Wash and Honey Pot. These claim to help treat and prevent yeast infections. However, most of them don't work leading to our first and most critical assumption. One, our product, our consumers want an all-natural alternative to traditional yeast infection treatments. And we were ecstatic when we found over 80% said yes. We did this in a course of four weeks, and it took us approximately $500. Our study was conducted on a sample size of 314 women, 44 face-to-face -face interviews, and 270 surveys done electronically, validating. No, one cannot have a product without a target market. So at first we thought, hey, let's just target all women. However, upon speaking to Dr. Raquel Gibbons, a prominent OBGYN in Jamaica, we found that no, we need to break it down. So she suggested women on birth control, as 50% have reported recurring yeast infections. 70% of menopausal women have yeast infection problems as well, and also men. Don't think we have forgotten about you. Though it is rare, 0.4% of the male population caught a yeast infection last year by a sexual act with their partners. Our second assumption, women are conscious about what goes into their bodies. And we were ecstatic when we found out 95% said yes. We are concerned about what goes into our bodies, thus validating our assumption. No, as a product, we can't be making these claims unless we have products and information to validate. So, our value proposition. We assumed 
our products would be all natural, itch free, immediate, and consistent itch relief. Ease of convenience, less application, less pain, and above all, easy to use. Here's a testimonial. Normally, when I have itching and like my back, anything, I'll three days or four days before my see result. This is magic in a box. These are some testimonials from our pre sales. 53 products were distributed and the demand was so great, we still have yet to meet it. Our clients love it. Wow, oh wow, my JJ feels like wow. Within three seconds, instantaneous relief. No. Our customers are the backbone of our product, and it is crucial for us to build a good relationship for them. So we have decided 24-hour access via real person and automated systems on both our social medias and WhatsApp if they have any concerns or queries. And in this competitive market, customers have more choices. So we have to be offering deals 20%. They have recommended this to us. As out of the group, 33 people said yes, we would want deals. It makes it better for us to be able to afford your product. Our channels of distribution will include our social media platforms, Earth Elements, which is a major distribution hub in Jamaica for natural treatments and holistic remedies, and pharmacies. Ease of convenience, Use for all. We assume that our product will, will be materialized in the form of a capsule. But when we, when we went out and we tested our assumptions, because we really want to know what the customers have to say, we found out that over 50% of these individuals would rather our products to be materialized in the form of a liquid that would be in a spray bottle. So, because we're listening to our customers, we had to pivot. Which indicates that majority wants a spray bottle, and they also recommended that um, it was less messy for them, it was user-friendly, as well as we validated with our mentor, Dr. Della Enzi, who is a biochemist for over 10 years, and she said that it would be great for us to step into the market as a cosmetic product in the starting and the sense that it will be easier also for the consumers to use the product based on their based on the information that we got from validations. This was among 314 persons. We had 444 face-to-face -face and 270 electronically. Moving forward, we have to um, look at our key activities. And at first, we assume that our key activities would include just marketing and product development. And during our assumptions, we did some tests, and we can say that our key activities include research and development. We did validate that um, product development is a process to move forward with, and marketing, since it is a way for us to create awareness for our product. We also, at first, assume that for our key activities, that it would consist of Kenton Supplies, that is a major supplier in China, and also Della Enzi Essential Oils and UTEC Lab. But when we did our validations, we found out that Kenton Supplies in China would not be able to supply or demand or satisfy our demand so we pivoted and we have EU beauty supplies in China as a major supplier and partner in terms of um, providing us with the products, sorry, with the bottles. Our cost structure would include marketing as well as product development, research and, research and development, sorry. And our unit cost for this product is only $1,000. For our revenue stream, we assume that um, 
customers would want our product for $2,500 because if we make a comparison with what they're paying to go to the doctor then lead to go to the pharmacy to fill that prescription, it would be approximately $6,000. So we said $2,500. When we went out and we did our research, we found out that persons were more interested in purchasing a product for $2,100. So that is the final price for our retail sales. For our wholesale sales, in which we will be used to gain revenue, it will be $1,800, and all those information were validated. At the YEA Expo, we went to further validate our products, and we were introduced to Junior Cabinet Minister Floyd Green, as well as Andrew James, the chair for the week, and the head of the Real Estate Association of Jamaica. We were told to go hard or go home because we have a good product, and that's exactly what we did. Our lessons learned. The main lesson learned, always listen to your customers. There will be the ones buying the product and they are the base of our monetary sales. Our summaries. As you can see, we have made nine hypotheses slash assumptions. We conducted 62 major interviews, three major pivots and two iterations. CCML, your one-stop shop for all your bacterial vaginosis and yeast infection treatment needs. Thank you. So our product, it's in the form of a nozzle. It's easy to pivot, easy to use. You just upright, insert, and spray. Or our product is so concentrated, it can be sprayed on either a tampon or a panty shield and absorbed into the body. Um, the $1,000 represents unit cost for the current, in its current form. Um, and how did you come, in, in your presentation, you did not actually explain how you came up on that cost, the $1,000. Okay, thank you for that question. The cost is uh, um, together by the amount for the bottles that we ship in from China and for the oils that we get from De La NZ Essentials, including the marketing cost and or labor cost as well. All right, that cost structure is critical to the presentation. Um, my particular, I'm particularly interested as it relates to your key resources, because there's one thing I thought would have been critical to, the, to your presentation, and that's the mention of patents as a key resource. In our competition, we were told it would be unwise for us to patent or to copyright our formulas you. right now due to the fact that we are in a competition. So after we have sorted everything and we have finished, that's the time which we will be able to pat copyright and patent our products. Yeah, yeah, in the intention to patent yes. would have been critical as well in the presentation. It, um, if you know, it's not patented yet, the intention to, to patent, patent. Um, is critical. Um, could you just talk me through your validation process? Um, I noticed that most of the the validation came from the survey, um, but in your summary, you mentioned that you had 60 something interviews. Um, so let's talk me through the, the, the validation process. Were the interviews with stakeholders or with the customers themselves, and what informed that, that, that valid, the, validation? Decision? The 63 critical interviews were in the form of forums. Those were, those were face to face. The 44 were done like randomly in halfway tree. The rest came from us sitting down with a group of students from the nursing faculty as they are more exposed to female and male reproductive issues. So when we sat down, that's when we decided, okay, they told us what to change, what chemicals in our comp competitors would be messing with bodies, and also how much they decided for us to sell the products for. They just made a mention. 
And just to add to that, we also did um, research with UTEP Medical Center, and we also went to YEA Expo where we had a listing of, four, I think it was 53? 53, 53, 53 persons that we spoke to on that day. Okay, and I have a couple of questions, but just to start, um, one thing I didn't hear about was your expectation in terms of how you would deal with any sort of registration or, or um, interaction with the relevant r regulators or authorities within not just Jamaica, but wherever your, your target market is. Okay, thank you very much for that question. So to start off, our product was supposed to be a pharmaceutical. However, when we went to the Scientific Research Council, they told us for our time period, it would take too long. So when we spoke to our mentor, Dr. Delahe McKenzie, she said it would be better for us to do it in the form of a cosmetic. And the process for, um, for certification from the Scientific Research Council takes two years. So along that time, it would be best for us to go and do more research, make better formulations, and we can, we would be back and forth getting information to them. They would be helping us, and we also would be in contact with the Bureau of Standard. And when everything is certified by the Scientific Research Council, that's when we intend to get our products to the Federal Drug Administration and get it certified for US sales and consumption. Okay, sure. The last question, and it kind of um, dovetails into what you said a while ago. Um, I want to fully understand, uh, because I don't feel it was articulated as well as it could have been in the presentation, what is your plan to actually get the product out to um, your end customer, and what, um, where, in, in, what's your geographic location? Is it that you're, you're really looking at, say, um, storefronts in Jamaica? You spoke a little bit about Twitter and an online strategy. Um, and I see here in the documents you sent us some interaction with Alibaba, which is a more international and, and um, kind of Chinese, Asian-focused uh, website. So can you go a little bit more into that? Hey, thank you so much for that question. Um, just to add to that is uh, our products I think it was one of the reviews. Um, it was from someone that ordered a product from Canada. And we sent that um, product, and the person tried the product and everything, and we got to that response. So it is something that is in, we want to market in the Caribbean. It is not something that is an issue only in Jamaica. It is a worldwide issue, so it's a very huge market, I can say. In terms of uh, being, um, in terms of being in supermarkets and uh, earth elements, those are our, our distribution channels that we will be using to get our products out there. We have already spoke with earth elements about distributing our products, so that is validated already. Della Enz Essential Oils, as you saw there with the note, she is our mentor as well as she's working with us. She also has her store and she also wants the product there. So thank you to C-Squared ML. And now we're going to hear from JA Bioplastic. Did you know that 1 trillion tons of plastic bags are produced annually and only 8% is recycled? This is what is causing global pollution. We can see it in Africa. We can see it in Asia and even the United States. Even though they have a, man um, a management system, not even them can recycle themselves out of this crisis. So we already are aware of some of the issues that plastic is causing our environment. However, I want to turn your attention to microplastic, which is cancerous, a smaller form of the plastic that is now found in 94% of our global tap water, and it's now also found in the food we eat. That is why government across the world is banning plastic, and that is, and that is one of the reasons why Jamaica has moved to, that, um, to also ban plastic in Jamaica. So they are looking for a solution that is a renewable alternative, cost-effective, and truly biodegradable. So the team got together and said, what if we could process agricultural produce into uh, production of single-use plastics. So the first crucial hypothesis, which would either bail or break our business, would be a low-cost bioplastic product that is formulated with agri-produce and can successfully enter the single-use plastic market. Our secondary hypothesis is that the biodegradable bag would be our launch product. So we had four assumptions. One is that material is readily available, it will, have, um, it will back by science, 
it, is also, it will also have um, the feeling and look of real plastic, and also the buyer bags would be our launch product. So after about three months with $25,000, uh, $25, after 40 iterations of the formula, we were able to create our minimum viable product, which is the plastic film. This plastic film boasts 100% organic, biodegradable, compostable, water-soluble, food-grade, and fire-retardant properties. So when a plastic takes over 100 years to degrade, our plastic degrades in a month. And that is, and also, two days in the earth, it's fire, and it's also fire retardant. So when you put the flame on it, it won't ignite. So we were back and validated by um, top researchers, such as Professor Mona Weber. We are, you can look in your dossier. There are documents are there as validation proof. NEPA has also provided us with um, validation in terms of the environment. SRC has commented on the science behind it. BSJ has asked me to sit on their board to standardize bioplastic in Jamaica. And also, Canada, Canadian Plastic Association has called us to offer technical support. So we now update the value proposition. And our, key seg and our customer segment is the end users. At this time, we interviewed over 50 boat local internationally. What we found is that they do believe that the environment is impacted by plastic. However, they would not go out their way to really go and buy the bags. So we learned that unless they are pushed by manufacturers or policies, such as the government, then they would not have gone out there. So not, they're not really that environmentally considerate. So we went and spoke to manufacturers in Jamaica, England, and also um, UK, and they say that they were interested. What we learned, though, is that they don't want the bags. They want the resins, the resins that will create their bags. And we also found that we would have ended up being a competitor with them, and, and, and at the same time, to go and do a, a plastic bag factory setup is not lean. So at this point, after 16 iterations, we were able to develop the resins in a month. And this resin will now allow the manufacturers to do buyer bags, cutters, straws, and plates. So after the validation, we had manufacturers um, coming on board to purchase, two in Jamaica, three in the Caribbean, and six international manufacturers across the world. Here are some of the interviews that we had and the logos represent international manufacturers. So in terms of our um, first, our secondary hypothesis that 100% biodegradable plastic bag would be the best launch product, that was fall, and we, has to, we had to pivot. So no longer the JA bags are our um, value proposition, it's now bioplastic resin, which now offer a triple bottom line effect, which it provides our manufacturers with social, economical, and environmental benefit. We also have a much lean key activity and key resources, which is just going to make the resins. Now we pivot away from the end users and now income our plastic manufacturers. We also look at the quality, we want to provide quality customer service to our um, customers, but we want to also do it through promotion as a strategy. Our channel will also be validated through a lean way, which is through a distributor. So we went to validate that. And within two, 20 days, we got letters confirming partnership and invitation to events and also, we were featured on talk shows in the newspaper, and we were also on Business Access and Stephen Match Sunrise. In terms of our distribution, this too was validated when we got contact from Flexpack and Dawani from India to distribute across the globe for us. Here's, and the validation is in your dossier. So the custom, that was also validated. So we wanted to know if we had adequate supply. So we spoke to the agricultural agencies and what they're saying that there is enough to supply the only the region or the local market and the region as the Caribbean, but not enough to, to supply the world. So what we'd have to do, which is a lean way of getting to our international manufacturer, is through licensing. So this completes our circular economy. So the farmers produce, we convert their produce into resins, the resins are converted to plastic by manufacturers, and then it's now going to a compost and then, and then goes back to be a fertilizer for the crops. So now we update our key partners, and now we have then one of our key resources would be a patent, which is now being filed through J um, JIPO, and we also have our one pound of resin costing, um, well, a sale of, our res of a pound of our resin is 156, and we'll call it 7% from our royalty. In terms of our cost, it's $83 per pound. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a monthly recurring revenue. So in terms of price comparison, it's actually, well, we are at $2.30, while our competitors are up to $4 a pound. This is for the two saving for our manufacturers. So the market is growing by 30%. And by 
And by 2030, it is going to be big as $300 billion. So here are some of the interest to buy from Flexpack to Wisinko to Dominic Republic, and even India is asking for 1.1 million pounds of resin per month. Here are some, and in your dossier, you can see that they're asking 50,000 pounds, 500 tons, and the list go on into Nigeria, who recently contacted us that they want the product in Nigeria to assist their plastic pollution issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jordan Freeman, an MP researcher in the Biotechnology Center at the University of Westerners. I'm also the National Youth Innovator, first place winner of the UVC, and I'm also the Startup of the Year. I'm also invited or a part of the Committee for the Standardization of Bioplastics in Jamaica. So we identified a global problem. We validated it in a, in a lean way. We also found disruptive distribution channels and marketing strategies. And we also have a high bar to entry through our pending patent. So our crucial hypothesis was a low-cost bioplastic product that is formulated. This was found to be true. However, we thought that our JA Biobags would have been the, the product to launch with. That was false. We had to pivot to the resins. Thanks to the business model canvas, we were able to have JA Bioplastic Resin offering a greater applicability and scale. Let us take our world out of plastic. Judges, at this time, we'll now present our samples. I have a question for you. I'll, I'll ask the supply question and I'll Doug to ask the, the distribution question. Um, so you're converting um, food stock into, into, into plastic resins, right? Yes, sir. Talk me through the supply chain arrangement to get those food stocks. And now, now how are you going to get those without impacting the national food supply? Mm -hmm if you're going to be supplying this at a global scale. Okay, no problem, sir. So firstly, Jamaica produced over 170 tons of the raw material, and there's a surplus that is actually thrown away, which is another 20,000. And we, that will be enough to even support without even touching the food, um, the food source that we provide for our you know, economy. In terms of the, the, this, the channel, that how to get, how we get it, because of the, in, um, the partnership with RADA and the other agricultural agency, they are asking us that they're, well, they're, what they want, they want to have their farmers sending in their products. They are going around to collect around of these products and then they come to Kingston, and that's the arena we're making to deliver them to our facility for production purposes. Okay, so um, just to comment to say, that I know that would be a, a difficult process, but Given, given what you're doing here, I'm hoping that you actually can get that done. But the um, question I really have is on the other side of the, the coin now, which is distribution. Um, so how do you expect, so I, I know you, you mentioned a number of names, a number of distributors that, that are saying, okay, we want your product. But how will you actually get the product to them? So for example, I saw Wisinko on, um, on your list. Is it that Wisinko wants um, to, to purchase a product for their own use, or is it that they would like they they would distribute it throughout Jamaica and, and even um, provide you with a channel to then get to these international distributors. Essentially, um, you know, th there is for me a little bit of a gap between yes, you have your production facility. Um, I assume you'd have some sort of storage of your resins, and then now, how does your customer get the resins? Do you, are you going to? ship it to them? Are you going to truck it to them? Or, or is there some, some other in between there? Well, if it's for local, then yes, we will truck it to them in terms of delivery. If it's regional, we will ship it to them. If it's further out of the region, then that would be done through our license, where we will provide a particular the formula on the contractual um, basis, and that will be provided to their region under one company. For example, I'll show you Dawali, who is the biggest in, um, in, the, in the Asian continent, and he will have access to supply to that region, providing us some royalty after. Yes, sir, outside of our space. Here. Yeah, and, and that's actually an interesting um, model to use. Um, but just going back to the distribution for a little bit, um, since it sounds like you're saying you're actually going to manage the the connection between yourself and your clients, how have you, um, what have you done to look at what, what you really need to do to get that done and also um, the implications on the cost to you and therefore the um, you know margins and, and all of that for your product? 
Okay. So in terms of the margin and the cost to get it, well, as I've said, the space that there's enough margin in the markup to allow for that type of expense, especially to our manufacturers. Um, I remember what they said to me, they're willing to spend up to $5 a pound of the bioplastic resins because it allowed them to enter new markets. So me selling at 230 and them who willing and they're willing to pay up to $5 a pound. So it's from that um, respect that there's enough margin for them to really, in terms of cost of distribution across sir. My question is a follow-up to that. Um, yes. It really speaks to the profit maximizing price. How did you come about, how do you get to the place of determining what is your profit maximizing price? To your, to, the, to your B2B customers. Okay, all right. So when we, based on the formula and the yield that we can get compared to what is done by other biodegradable compounds, our product that they, sorry, resins that they have out there, we're able to um, reduce our costs because our input cost is much um, less based on the formulation that we're using, opposed to getting expensive oxy enzymes, which are now added to plastic, which are petroleum-based plastics, to actually degrade the plastic. And that is what makes it more expensive for them. So ours, from the scratch, is made biodegradable. The, those who are making their plastic is actually petroleum resins. Then they add a master batch of enzymes to help to degrade the plastic, but when it degrades the plastic, it turns something called microplastic, and this microplastic is what is bro broken down in the environment to cause us even more harm, contaminating the water, contaminating food, and leading us to cancer. Um, just a final question. You made three critical pivots, um, one in terms of the product, yes, sir. the other in terms of the customer, and then the, the distribution channel in terms of licensing. Just take me through the validation process um, for those three, those three pivots. Okay, so regards to the, um, the moving from plastic, to, I'm sorry, the plastic bags to the resins, that happened because, as I said before, when we validated the end users who would buy the bags, and we were look, we also just validating um, a scope because they also said that unless my, who we spoke to. Oh, we spoke to the, we spoke to like shoppers, persons who buy at the supermarket. We spoke to policymakers and we spoke to the manufacturers like Wisinko and Flexpack. And that is where we got the idea that they are more, they're interested, well, that segment is more interested in the resins, while the end users who buy the bags at the shoppers, they, unless it's provided for them to use, they're not going to go to their way to, you know, to buy bags to save the environment. So realize that they wouldn't have been the, um, the ideal customer segment. In terms of JIPO, we had a discussion with JIPO, and they're looking for the most suitable way to protect the document or the formula. However, when we were doing the, um, the looking for the supply chain from Jamaica, what we found out is that we won't be able to supply the world. So a better way is really licen licensing our technology, and that is how we pivoted to, well, actually adding the license to the, um, the, um, the key resources as a part of our key resources. Yes, sir. That's all? All right, thank you for having me. Up next, we have Prelabs. Hello, everyone. My name is Yakini. That's Matthew and Kristen. And today, we're going to talk about uh, how we're using this to solve a problem that's costing the developing world over $247 trillion each year. Now, crime and theft is the most problematic factor for doing business in Jamaica. But let's not just talk about how it affects the economy and the private sector. How many of us in this room have had a personal experience where we had loss of value loss of harm done to us or loss of life from either us or somebody that we know due to property evasion and crime and theft. How many of us have suffered because of the scourge that had been plaguing Jamaican society for a very long time? We thought as engineers, we could come up with a solution that people could afford that helped solve this problem. So that's where we had our first hypothesis. We think all we needed to do was make an affordable sensor and alarm system and we could provide safety for people. So we decided to build this and test this. We built a simple wireless battery powered motion sensor that they could place outside my office and from where I was in my office, it would alarm and let me know if somebody was outside lay away to me so I can look out my window or you know, make any appropriate actions. It worked well, I still use it to this day. And you know, the results were great, but this wasn't enough. We had to talk to people. We had to find out if they would buy it and how they would use it. People told us that they would use it at their home instead of signing up with Hawk and King Alarm. They'd use it on campus when they're studying. They'd use it when they're having places in meetings in public places. They'd use it when they go camping. Farmers said they'd use it on the farms. So we had an idea of what our customer segments would look like. We had an easy alternative to security. We were portable. When you finish another day, you can pack up your security system and go home. And it was affordable. We anticipated that we can distribute this at stores like home centers and high-profile farmers. And we'd relate to our customers through phone calls. 
We'd imagine we have to do some R&D and manufacturing, given that this is something that we're going to be doing by making sensors as well as selling them. This cost us about $6,000 and three weeks to validate. So we had a portable alarm system. That was our first iteration. Thankfully, to PowerPre, another product that we've made and are currently selling in the Jamaican market, we're able to validate our key activities and key resources. So we can green those out. And we already have the workstations. We already have the technical expertise. We know where we can get the components to make these things for $2,000 and sell them to our retailers for $4,500. So we started building some traction. In this very building in November, we're invited to pitch at the CCIC Climate Summit. Everyone loved the idea, but only farmers approached us after, asking to make a purchase. So we thought, maybe we need to listen to what people have been telling us. So what are the next hypothesis? Maybe farmers have the biggest pain point. So we looked into it and found Prady Larson is costing Jamaicans $6 billion per year. It's actually the most impactful crime affecting the Jamaican economy. And not only that, but we found a story about in Trelawney where 32 cows were sold in that single day. Can you imagine how hard it is to move one cow? much less 32. These people are serious. That's an $8.3 million value worth of cows in a single day. And not only that, but not just stealing farming goods, they're stealing equipment as well. $15 million were sold in a day. And we looked into it, and we saw numerous articles that spoke to several farmers, and everyone had a heartfelt story about how Prady Larson was severely impacting their livelihood. We even spoke to the managing director for Crime Stop, Ms. Gentles, and she told us that there's actually a stolen cattle for gun trade with Haiti, where they actually supply guns that further fuse our current problem when we supply them with stolen cattle. And it's not just limited to Jamaica. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they lose $200 million per year to pay the larceny. And in Belize, they lose $30 billion. It's not a regional problem either. In Africa alone, South Africa, they lose $2 trillion a year to pay the larceny. And it's on the rise. So we decided maybe we should just focus on farmers because this is clearly the biggest pain point. We might have to drop the portable aspect of our value proposition to have a more rigid weather resistance solution. And we anticipate that we can probably partner with RADA for their networks relating to our customers. So this is our next iteration on our first pivot. We went from a portable alarm system to a Pradel alarm system. So we need to answer three critical questions. Will Rada want to partner with us? So we spoke to their CEO. He was very excited. We didn't even have to ask him. He wanted to endorse us and let us use the network. So that was great. We'll have to sell this. We spoke to their assistant vice president, Lieutenant Colonel Jamie O'Gilvey. He also thinks something farmers want, especially the big farmers. And he's going to talk with the team and see how quickly we can get these sensors sold at Hypro. Most important question, though, will farmers buy this? We just asked them for $6,000. We conducted interviews on a survey, and 82% said yes. 43% said a strong yes, they would buy it. So, okay, we're definitely in the right direction. There's over 30 farmers that we spoke to. So we can validate our key partners as well as how we're relating to our customers, our distribution channels, as well as our value proposition. Customers wanted it, and we can do this at the price point that we want to do it for, sell it for. But it's a good business. But then Surge approached us. They we're working on a drone before, and they wanted to use our drone to patrol their properties. But we had an idea that or we knew from our experience that this might not be the most feasible application because drones have limited battery life. So we had an hypothesis. If we can make our sensors work with a drone and offer video footage to increase efficiency, we had a good business before, but we can have a huge global scalable business with a very unique value proposition. So we decided to build it, test it, and demonstrate it at UA Research Day. And after three weeks, we had this. Watchdog drone security system. Effectively how this works, sensors are placed strategically around a location text intruders that sends a signal to our drone that automatically activates, takes off, and flies to the location without any need of assistance from a pilot. We did this in three weeks. If we wanted to this, apply this on a commercial scale, it would cost about $800,000 because we need to make it very wind resistant, night vision, um, and image stabilization. We validated the key aspect of our value proposition in three weeks, but less than 10% of that cost. Our watch out drone currently takes a full circuit view of where the sensor is, the video can be live streamed as well as recorded for investigation purposes. It has a buzzer and a bright LED lights on it that will startle intruders. And when they flee, you can see which direction they're heading for further investigations. The drone then flies back on its own from the GPS location it saved for self-charging. So we had great results from this. We found that the drone that we built can already fly significantly faster than a human can sprint. Great response. We also found that if you try and set up CCTVs on a farm, it can be very expensive and sometimes even impossible because of infrastructure purposes, and you can still have numerous blind spots. Our drone can cover this area for a fraction of the cost without having as many blind spots. We also found that drone presence deters people in the first place. People are terrified of these things. Nobody's going to want to come near a farm if they can see them. So this is where we had our third iteration. We added drones to our value proposition. This cost us $35,000 in three weeks. After, um, after your research today, two key things happened. A security company approaches wanting to partner, and two different farmers said they wanted it, but they stressed the importance of our response. 
So we added the drones to our system, but we haven't validated it. And we anticipate we need to create the companies, and we'll be making the drones as well as selling them. This is where our fifth hypothesis came in, which is critical. We can sell the drones to security companies and big farmers. So we called and had meetings with the security companies. We met with King Alarm. They said the value that we're adding is huge, not just for farmers, but for Jamaica. They may not have farming clients, but they can think of a few industrial complexes that would want it, and they can definitely see, them invest see themselves investing in us. We also spoke to Hawkeye. Stephen Room said we, we, he definitely thinks you have something major. He can see this for a number of places, especially for cannabis farms, where there's a lot of money going in that right now, as well as industrial clients. And he'd be willing to look into a pilot project with us. But security companies also found out have limits to response in some parishes. And they also mentioned additional capital costs of our system will be a deterrent. The drones also require some maintenance and a lot of technical expertise that only we can provide. Security companies didn't want to have to deal with this. So we were wrong with this hypothesis. We couldn't sell it to them. But we found that the subscription model can offset this initial cost while having our services that we provide as a retainer. And Hawkeye was supportive of the suggestion. So this is where our fourth iteration. We wouldn't be selling the drones, but we'd be um, having subscribers for our drone system. So we stopped selling, we have a subscription fee, and we stopped thinking about um, security companies as just partners, but as distribution channels and a customer segment. It costs us $2,000 in two weeks. But can we operate these drones legally? Well, this was critical. So we spoke to the heads themselves, probably in their license. CA, um, Civil Aviation Authority told us, yes, we do. Thankfully, it's free, and it's identical across the region and the world. But what about Africa? So we had a license, or we can get a license, and it's free. But what about Africa? Thanks to Zipline, who have been delivering medical packages across Africa, African governments have actually loosened the regulations because of the value propositions that the no drones can add. So we can't scale there. But will big farmers even want to invest in this? Which is a big question. So we spoke to Mark Ramsey, who, or Hawkeye had told us yes. Spoke to Mark Ramsey, who's actually used drones for crop dusting to work with big farms, and he said the, the clients have been asking for this for years. We also spoke back to Serge, who told us, asked why we took so long to get back, and they're very interested. So we're able to validate the value proposition on our customer segments, our key partners, and our price points for $5,000 in two weeks. But why stop at farmers? The security companies told us that, you know, they have numerous applications this can apply to. Indust other, other large properties, industrial complexes, university campuses, which are all over the world. You know, we can scale. We can, we can go big. We don't have to limit ourselves. What's next is the world. Thank you very much, and stay safe. You, you spent a lot of time val um, validating the, the product and the value proposition. Could you take me through the validation process for the channel and the customer relation? As a reminder, um, we're doing two things. We're selling the sensors, and we're having a subscription for the service, which incorporates the sensors. To validate the sensors, we, the distribution channels, right, so we spoke to Hypro, and they said they want to sell the sensors. But um, we spoke to, we surveyed farmers, um, I interviewed them and asked them if they, we showed them our system and asked them if they pay $6,000 for this, and we got 82% saying yes and 42% saying a strong yes. Yes, and um, what was the other question? Um, oh, relationships. Yeah, we spoke to Rada CEO. I was actually just WhatsApping this morning. He's trying to set up a, a big farm that we can test our system on. Um, and he was more than willing. To, we didn't have to ask. We are saying, yeah, man, we can endorse you. Uh, you, you can even use our networks. That meeting went really short and it went really, it was very productive. As well as a meeting with Hawkeye. <laughs> How did you solve the issue in terms of the, the farmers saying that they, they needed a response in right. addition to? So there are two ways they can acquire a system. Yikes, wrong way. You can get it directly through us, or you can get it through the security companies that offer the response. So, if, for example, if you want cameras at your home, but you don't necessarily have a sign up with King Alarm, you can buy the cameras and you can still view it yourself. But if you don't want to have to deal with that, you can contract us, create a company that will do all that viewing and monitoring for you, and also coordinate a response whenever there is a breach. So a similar model to how CCTVs are implemented. How do you justify your subscription fees as a revenue stream? Right, so effectively what's going to happen, the drones are going to require some maintenance. They're, the system is very technical and it's going to involve a lot of, um, we're going to have to be very involved in the process in setting it up, as well as ensuring that it's working as it should. If, if there's any issue with the system, it's going to be very difficult for anyone that's not trained to fix them. Um, and Hawkeye explicitly told us that we're not interested in doing that part of the system, but we're receptive if you want to have a retainer, and, which is what they do with GPS trackers. So I'm not seeing the systems around that subscription model internally in your organization. How do you s um, ensure that you, as an organization, as a business, okay. will be able to sustain that subscription model? Well, we would have to employ 
we'd have to employ um, technicians that can respond at the time. Um, we'd also have to have a few people that coordinate R&D that have to paying in salaries. Um, pardon me? Training as well, um, so that you'd be able to respond in a moment's notice to actually address these issues. So that was, I'm just, I think I answered the question. I don't think I need to go all the way there. And Did I? No, just Sorry? a little bit of a follow on. Um, if I'm a customer mm -hmm. and I go directly to you, I don't go to Hawkeye, mm -hmm. what do I get? What, uh, what is it that I'm, I'm receiving for the subscription? Is You're it that I just get a feed or what is it? Well, for one, the, if you want live footage, live streaming, it's, have to, it's going to have to come through our servers. So that's one thing that you're paying for. You also get the response. If you're having any issues with our system, we have to have tech support 24 seven that can both respond to the questions that you have as well as the site visits. And if you want to improve the system, for example, if you realize that, you know, we thought this was a problem area, but people are actually coming from this side. We can set up more sensors. We can expand our network to increase the range. A lot of, if, if you want, if you want um, more coverage, you can uh, add additional drones that, so they have less downtime in terms of um, when the batteries are charging and things like that. Okay, and um, you spoke to the drones and further development being needed. What's the strategy to, to get the drones um, essentially whether or whatever it is capable that, to make sure that they don't, for lack of a better word, drop out of the sky? Right, so conveniently, um, what we do on this drone are the systems. So there's a bunch of different things communicating that we write the code for and we um, build circuit boards for to make it do what we need to do. Um, yeah, we've been working on drones for a very long time for another project. Uh, it's, it's actually these two's um, master's thesis for two different reasons. But we can actually acquire drones that give us the frame, the framework, not necessarily the systems that allow us to make drones weatherproof. And all we have to do is buy a gimbal and camera, which is expensive, but we can integrate it in, into our existing system. So, yeah, as well as those drones, in terms of the hardware, are already approved by the FAA, which is what JCAA recognizes. So we wouldn't necessarily be spending as much time trying to get the license as if we're trying to build them ourselves. Okay, finally, you mentioned Africa. Can you um, talk about your strategy, what, what the intentions are there? All right, so for the next year, or the next two years, what we'll plan to do, which we'll be talking to Hawkeye and Serge about, and even Hypro, is that we'll plan to do a pilot with three companies out here. We want to look at the past two previous years, what the reports are in theft and how much values were lost, and have our system at a reduced cost, offering for the next two years. Uh, <laughs> okay, for, for the next two years and um, see how well our value was added to that. Once we accomplish that, and once we simply repeat that model at the regular price that we'll plant, the, the price point that we'll have throughout the Caribbean and Jamaica, once we're the, 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 the thing is, while we're unique, is that the developing nations are the ones experience, experiencing the biggest problem with predator lives in the US, Japan, Germany. They're busy solving, using drones, solving bigger problems. But it's a huge problem that developing nations face, but they're not trying to solve it. So we have, we have our unique window of opportunity that we can enter this market providing a valid proposition for this huge problem in, in other countries, developing nations, and actually be leaders in autonomy for developing nations using drones. Um, so that's what we plan to do. We plan to train people, hire people that are of a similar background to us, have them set up operations throughout different places in Africa, and have them repeat the same process, given that the regulations over there are actually a lot less stringent than they are in the Caribbean right now. So that's, that's the plan of how we plan to enter those markets. I hope I answered the question well. Great. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. We want to say thank you to Pre Labs. And up next, we have Zermasol. 1,000 bacteria is sitting somewhere waiting on you. If you touch that place before entering this room, then it is now on your hands. You have likely transferred bacteria to the person sitting next to you if you just shook their hands. Worse yet, you will transfer bacteria to your kids later this evening. So where did you pick these up? If you guessed the doorknob, then you are correct. That is the culprit. So how big a problem is this, and when did this become my story? This became my story when my neighbor baby died through the contraction of bacteria during the dead baby scandal. This was a very sad time for the entire community. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Raven Stewart, and this is my partner, Tamara Walters, and we are Jamaicans. However, this is not just a Jamaican problem. This is a worldwide problem. It is estimated by the NIAID that illnesses caused by bacteria and viruses will cost the world's global economy a total of $100 trillion by 2050. And we have seen where this device can save hospitals anywhere between $300 to $500 per person per visit. But that's just the dollar figure. It is even more painful when we take a look at the worldwide death toll from these very same illnesses. 
At this point, we knew there needed to be a solution. So we started with something I found personally disturbing, touching doorknobs in public spaces. But did others have the same problem? And could a solution help to reduce the spread of bacteria and viruses? To learn more, we journeyed to the UA hospital to observe how others felt about touching doorknobs in public spaces. There, we observed 42 of 100 persons trying to avoid it. So we had a great idea and decided to pursue it. Even though our journey was filled with many roadblocks, our greatest roadblock was overcoming our most crucial hypothesis. We believe that most people are uncomfortable or even have a fear of touching public doorknobs. Thus far, we've done 325 face-to-face -face interviews and 520 questionnaires, and we found out that this was not only true, but it was a big social issue. We also learned that 74% of our respondents almost always try to avoid touching public doorknobs, as well as 65% explained if they can't avoid touching it, they simply use a tissue, napkin, or whatever they have in the possession. So at this point, we knew we had a problem worth solving. So we proposed a unique door lock equipped with UV lights to kill bacteria and viruses, as well as a timed-released hand sanitizer. We knew we needed medical expertise, so we went to several hospitals and clinics. We even had the opportunity to interview several doctors operating both locally and internationally. And they all loved the product so much, they gave us letters of validation, as well as a list of bacteria and viruses that we should focus on. But could this, could this solution be monetized, and who would we sell this to? We first proposed the government and businesses Businesses such as our hospitals, airports, restaurants, and hotels. We then hypothesized that these businesses care about the health and safety of their customers to implement protective measures. And there were no surprises, as 100% said yes. We've done in face to face interviews with 17 restaurants, six medical centers, and four hospitals, including the senior medical officer of KPH. Based on where we were in our journey, we hypothesized that these customers would be willing to change their current door locks and implement ours. And we hit a, a roadblock. We had to pivot. As businesses explained that this was just not practical. This took us approximately $600 and three weeks to validate. So we went back to the drawing board. We needed another solution. We made a total of three iterations before we came up with the concept of our UV belts. This is where we would have a flexible belt-like device that could be wrapped around doorknobs or door locks. We would then pack UV lights into these belts to create, to kill bacteria and viruses. We went back to these businesses, and 97% of them liked it. However, there were still some concerns, as they showed us areas in which it was just not practical. We went back to the drawing board. We made another total four iterations before we came up with the concept of our UV pads. This is where we would have uniquely molded pads that would be attached to current existing door locks. We would then pack UV lights into these pads to kill bacteria and viruses. We went back and they loved both devices. But we still needed to validate our spray. And during testing, we found persons explained it to be wet, weird, and uncomfortable. So we had to pivot from the spray. This took us approximately $400 and three days to validate. Customers also had concerns about the fear of UV lights and the direct penetration to skin. So to solve this problem, we implemented sensors that would detect the motion and proximity of a person to turn off the lights. We then made an assumption that businesses would be okay with changing batteries once every month. And we hit another roadblock. We had to pivot as businesses said this was just not possible. So we needed to find another source of energy. We turned to kinetic energy. This is where we are using the energy from opening and closing the door to, to power the device. So after all these iterations and pivoting, this is what we ended up with. A unique belt that could be wrapped around door locks. A person can decide how long or short they want their belt to be by purchasing additional links, as well as a unique pad. This is our product in action. So the big question at this point was, did we outdo our competitors? And the answer was yes. In order to use our competitor's product, you are required to retrofit a new set of door locks. And this was already invalidated earlier. And the senior medical officer of KPA said she has seen other products, but they are for surfaces. So we have addressed all our customers' concerns at this time. 
We have several interviews with doctors operating both locally and internationally, as well as two focus groups of nurses and public health officers. We are currently in negotiation with the Ministry of Health with a team that was put together by the minister himself. They even suggested that both schools and malls would be interested in this product, so we went out to test, and this was true. Both were interested, however, the schools could just not afford it, so we only added malls to our customer segment. We plan on directly approaching our customers to B2G and B2B, as well as these products will be available in hardware stores and pharmacies. We wanted these these channels, but did these channels want us? We did seven face-to-face -face interviews with hardware stores and 12 with pharmacies. And this was true as they thought this was the ideal place. This took us approximately $900 and two weeks to validate. But what about long-term continuous sales? We are making money from the sale of belt, the sale of our links to get the belt longer, as well as the sale of our UV pads. And we have seen where we can sell our product from a range of $25 to $35. This is our projection to, of sales to, pro, to scale up the businesses. And this is the estimated amount for each entity. But this is a good thing, ladies and gentlemen, as we have a per unit cost of five to 10 US dollars. We have several key partners who have, who have given us letters of intent, including the CCIC, who is currently assisting us with development, the SRC, who is assisting us with testing, and the government of Jamaica, who we are currently in negotiation with, as well as the suppliers of our parts. At this point, we thought we had finished with validation, but we noticed businesses continuously ask for an health app that could be an health app that would actually assist us in getting up-to-date information. So we added this to our customer relationship. We have key activities such as public awareness, research and design and marketing. And in terms of key resources, we are currently looking into patent of our devices, our devices, as well as our circuitry, because both are patentable. We also need direct materials, loose tools, and technical personnel. And personal learning, ladies and gentlemen, do not fall in love with your first product, be willing to pivot and Pivot and adjust. This took us approximately $6,000 and six months to validate. And in the beginning of our journey, we met many roadblocks, but we managed to, to find a product that had market fit. And in conclusion, we have three pre-orders, four major pivot, three, three pilot projects, one by the U University Hospital and one over by the University of Technology. We have six letters of intent and two we did Validation with two focus groups. Thank you. So this is actual UV lights that we are using to kill bacteria. We implemented a bunch of sensors that would stop the light from directly being penetrated on the person's skin. So whenever the person comes close, the light would simply turn off. And when it is removed, the light would turn on to kill bacteria and germs continuously. Um, we are currently work on it, working on it with the CCIC. The cost of building this part was about was twenty-five dollars, roughly twenty-five US dollars. Yeah. And that's what you expect the average cost to be. No, I'm. You're talking about. Remind me again. Um, I, I think me. I remember seeing Hold something on. like five to ten. Oh, okay. you, oh, you mean the, the prototype? But what is it, what's your projected unit cost? Our projected unit cost, we can build ten dollars, ten US dollars for the part. The cost, the cost, the cost. The, cost. the, price, again? the price would be um, $30. What, what, the entire revenue stream, what does that, that look like? Mm -hmm. entire Go back to the revenue stream. stream. Back. Back. Yeah. Oh, use and, the mic. Yeah. Sorry, guys, use the mic. The, our revenue stream, we are selling our belts as well as the sale of cubes. So the cubes are basically the links on the belt so a person can decide how long or short they want their belt to be because what not the, every door. Value, um, the cubes. So the cubes is for $25 while, while, no, the belt is for $25. The cubes can be from $3 to $4, while the UV pads can be for $30. But the UV pad is a premium product. It depends on the complexity of the door lock itself. Okay, and as a follow-on, what's the life cycle or the um, life of all of these products? Good question. That's a, that's a very good question. So there's no specific life cycle. It lasts as long as you want it to. Okay, so the follow-on question is, um, how are you going to make money if I only come to you once? Mm, recording, really recording. That's a, that's a good question. 
<laughs> it's a question about recurring revenue. The, if the model, if, if there is no, rec um, there is no, there is no building for reco recurring revenue, the model will not work. So we're asking, no, what is your recurring revenue model? Oh, no, I get. Oh, it will, li will, li will li be less likely to work. Okay, so sorry, that's a more diplomatic way of saying. What <laughs> no, I understand what she's trying to say. Sorry about that. That was my fault. That was my fault. So, so in order to get resales, we're actually thinking about. So the lights there themselves they wear out over a period of time. So you would have to repurchase the product in order to get. You purchase the product. Replace the lights. Oh, okay. So, so then are you also looking at um, uh, some sort of maintenance or management contract um, to essentially do yes, that? Yes, yes. So we added them to the, the technical personnel to our key revenues, to our key resources. Sorry. What's your strategy for um, as well as the barriers to entry? So we have a differentiated product as well as we, we are currently looking into patenting the product because this product is a... Because we... E this, the board on the product itself can be patentable because we could not find a customized board that could be used to just slap together to produce the product. So I think that would be a very high barrier to entry, as well as the device itself is patentable. When it comes to um, consumer products, um, branding becomes an issue. What is your strategy as it relates to branding? Um, we are definitely looking in the direction of a differentiated product. Differentiate, oh, meaning, home. meaning home. what? Because, yeah. all right. What's a unique selling proposition? It's a simple, simple add-on. Because in order to use our competitor's product, you're, you, you can't do this. You would simply have to buy a new lock and retrofit it. And our competitor's products are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's ranged it's range from 85 to $130. And this is for $30. Did you validate the, the health hub? It's, it's an interesting yes, idea. Yes, it, it, it was validated. It was validated. Tell me about the validation process for that. We spoke to. So the, the health the health app, we the first the first point of our health app came from the senior medical officer of KPH. He thought this would be a good thing for the public to have because when there's a breakout, it's kind of kept low inside the government. So so she wanted it to persons to see where these breakouts were coming from, etc. So how does that relate to the, the sale of the, the primary product? So the app would basically contain information on the product itself and all the bacteria that UV lights can kill and all the harmful effects of each bacteria. Oh, it's, a, it's a technical add-on. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a technical add-on. And each person that purchases one of the UV pads, they, they get access to the app? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so we just heard from Zermasal, and up next we have J.A. Scent. Aren't you frustrated with pimples and breakouts? Wouldn't you want to treat your acne without having to worry about what is in the product? Ladies, guys, I know you would love to have a healthy alternative. And at Jason Body Wellness, we provide this. A healthy, natural solution to treat your acne, leaving you with flawless, beautiful skin. Ladies, don't you want to wear less concealer? Remember, less is best. With Jason Body Wellness, you will love the skin you're in. Say bye-bye to acne with Jason. So everyone, could I see a show of hands of all those who have a sweet tooth? Or craves junk food? Great. So have you ever eaten that soft, sweet cake or that mouth-watering pizza late at night? And in the morning, you wake up to a huge volcano erupting on your face? And when you squeeze, that lava just oozes? Disgusting, right? <laughs> I know for some of us, it's a simple squeeze and you move on with life. But for others, this is devastating. And it's considered the eighth most prevalent disease worldwide. It affects 645 million people globally. And the cost of treatment in the US exceeds $3 billion each year. Personally, I have a friend who suffers from this terrible skin condition. She's so self-conscious that she can't even go outside without wearing makeup. She cannot even wear altar backs or bathing suits because she's uncomfortable. And it causes stress, 
frustration, lack of confidence, and poor body image. And this is the pain of acne. I know you're thinking, another acne product? But what if I told you that these products were laden with synthetic chemicals that are known carcinogens? These are not the kind of things that you want to put on your skin. Furthermore, we spoke with Dr. Patricia Yap, and she confirmed that the current products on the market are not for persons with dark complexion. They get rid of the spots. However, they, do, they get rid of the bumps, but they do not get rid of the spots, which is also associated with acne. Based on this, we hypothesize that Jamaicans want a natural solution to treat their acne. So we went out, we did our surveys, we, inter we surveyed 200 persons over the span of three months, and we were happy to find that 95% of them were interested in a natural solution. We did this over the span of three months, and it didn't cost us anything. We went on to hypothesize that persons wanted a cream to treat their acne. We couldn't be more wrong as we found that only 10% of them were interested in a cream and 70% wanted a soap. And so, we pivoted. We came up with a soap that is formulated with ingredients that will be used to treat the dark spots on the skin as well as the bumps. And it's all natural, no synthetic ingredients to cause any cancer. Our product is natural, it's effective, and it's also convenient. We went, out to, to, we went out to validate this. We went to the Young Entrepreneurs Association. We did 50 face-to-face -face interviews, and it cost us $7,500. We found that clients loved it. So we know we have competitors. We know there's Ravish, there's Morgan Creeks, but we believe that our product is more effective. So we did our surveys. We got feedback from persons, and they loved our product. They said that they noticed changes in their skin, and they also, one person even mentioned that he uses it to tone as it um, lightens his complexion. We realized, however, that whereas it did get rid of the bumps, it was still not as effective as we wanted it to be. And so we iterated and we added our serum. And the 25 observations over the span of two months didn't cost us anything. We went out to validate. We received some positive feedback. Person said that it was convenient, it enabled control, it was less messy. However, we also were told that it was too small and it looked like lip gloss. We did this over two weeks and it cost us $400. So we thought, how can we get persons who are not, that don't like the look to be more comfortable with our product? We got a suggestion to do a plaster. We went out and we validated this and clients loved it. We went to the Scientific Research Council to approach them to develop our plaster. We did two visits in three weeks, and it cost us $800. However, we found that Scientific Research Council, the process would have been too long for us, and the cost was too high. And so we met with Dr. Shetdela K. McKenzie, who was willing to work with us. This was done. This cost us $10,000, and the process is ongoing. We're still developing the plaster. This is a letter of intent showing that she's willing to work with us on our plaster. And these are the iterations that we've made so far. We realized that tea tree, which is an active ingredient in our serum, is a known antibacterial agent. And it's also effective at treating bacteria that cause other skin conditions, such as boils and folliculitis. And so we're in the process of, we're thinking of using our serum as a liquid bandage that will protect the area as well as reduce the spread of infection, this is currently being validated. Based on the feedback that we have received so far, we believe that males and females between the ages of 12 to 40 would be interested in our products. We went out to validate this. We surveyed 230 persons, and we were pleased to find that 60% of females that we, that we um, surveyed and 40% of males were interested in our products. Thus, our hypothesis was validated. We also spoke with Dr. Alicia Jordan and Dr. Richard Denno, and they both confirmed that females are more prone to acne because of our hormones, and males, however, tend to have a more severe form of acne. Based on this, our customer segment was validated. 
So we'll be targeting males and females between the ages of age to 21 with dark complexion. We went on to hypothesize that our customers would want discounts and promotions. However, whereas the discounts was validated, we realized that only 8% wanted promotions and the majority wanted um, giveaways. And so our discounts was validated, however, we iterated. So we'll be offering giveaways and, and discounts instead of promotions. We further went on to hypothesize that our customers want to purchase our products through pharmacies and health stores. We did our survey and we found that 50% wanted to be in the 50% would purchase it through pharmacies. However, only 8% were interested in the health stores. A whopping 32% would purchase it online. And so we verified the pharmacies. However, we pivoted, we iterated with the health stores and we'll be offering our products online through Facebook, Instagram, and our website, which we're currently developing, as well as pharmacies. Our key activities include marketing, research, and development, as well as distribution. Our key staff includes our dermatologists, our chemists, our sales team, and our marketing team. And our key partners include Della Enzi and Starfish Oils, who will be helping us with the development and the manufacturing of the products. Our costs are made up of distribution and marketing, salaries, research, and development. And our revenues will be direct sales that will go face-to-face -face with the customers, as well as through retail stores and pharmacies. This is a copy of our profit projection. We hypothesized that persons would be willing to pay $1,000 for our soaps. We went out and validated this. And based on the average cost, it was indeed $1,000. And so we could proceed, as we realized that this was something that we could effectively monetize. What we've learned overall is that you are to listen to your customer. They are a very important part of the process. Be flexible and willing to change. And also, we learned that you must be willing to adjust and pivot as often as is necessary. We did 128, in closing, we did 128 interviews, one pivot, 20 observations, 230 questionnaires, Three iterations, we have three letters of commitment. This was done over the span of 25 weeks and it cost us $18,700. Choose Jacent to get rid of your acne and to reclaim your beautiful skin. Reclaim your confidence with Jacent Body Wellness. Thank you. Uh, what I liked about the presentation is the fact that I could see very clearly the evolution of, the, of your minimum viable product. But what concerns me is I'm not certain I saw the use of that MVP in your validation process. So you used interviews, you used um, questionnaires, but did you use the actual product? For example, when you spoke to how much you would sell it for, you said people said they'll be willing to purchase for a thousand. Did anybody actually buy for a thousand dollars? That's what validation is really about. Um, no, we didn't, we didn't have any sales as the product is still being developed. That's in relation to our plaster, it's still being developed. But we showed persons, so they looked at it, they smelt it, and we asked them how much they'd be willing to pay. And the average cost of our data shows that they'd be willing to pay $1,000. Some persons even said 2,500, but we averaged it out based on the results to be $1,000. Yeah, but um, as I said, in terms of you're using your MVP for validation, right. not certain that was used as well as it could because in, in may, it's not very often that we have persons presenting and having an MVP um, evolving and we're seeing that those iterations clearly and those that would allow you to know to use a product in your validation process. Not certain that that happened as well as it could have. But, okay. but it was good that it was evolving. Right. Well, we did show persons the products, and that's the price that they advise us they'd be willing to pay. And we, we did about um, 50 face-to-face -face interviews. And no actual sales? No, because, as I said, it's still in development, so we can't, we can't sell it. Okay. Um, you identified that a lot of your customer base wants to buy this through, through pharmacies. Have you had any discussions with anybody in that industry in terms of interest? Well, we have approached a few persons. Um, 
However, we have not yet um, entered any pharmacy at this point in time, but we have had the discussion with a few of them, and they have advised us the process that we need to go through in order when we're ready to get to that stage. Are you planning to do online sales? Definitely. We have a website that we're in the process of developing. Okay. So that's, that's a strategy for using um, Facebook and Instagram as your Right, channel. because we realize that our younger demographic, a lot of them know they purchase, they look up items on Instagram. So we found that when we, when we approach persons, they ask us, are you on Instagram, are you on Facebook? So they're looking at products, and that's where a lot of them are making their decisions as to what they're purchasing. Okay. So we have our pages, and when we're ready, they'll be able to contact us through that medium. Final question. You're entering a very competitive market space. Right. Um, <laughs> just talk me through the, the, the process of selecting this 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 very competitive space to enter and how are you going to differentiate yourself from established um, players so as the ones that you, you, had, you had put right. on the screen? So we know that it's very competitive, but acne is still a very um, still a prominent problem. Persons in the United States, they have a different skin type from us. And so most of the products that are on the market, even in our local pharmacies, we spoke with Dr. Patricia who verified this. They're not made for persons with dark skin. They don't work as well for us as they do for persons overseas. And so we realize that locally, that's an opportunity for us to enter the market. Um, it is still competitive as we do have local competitors. However, we have iterated and added our serum that we believe will give us a boost in being more effective. Because what we realize is that your soap alone, you put it on your skin and you wash it off, so it doesn't stay in the skin and effectively solve the problem, and that's where our serum comes in. So what's your most critical assumption regarding your target customer, persons with dark skin? What is their most significant pain point? Their most significant pain point, I believe, would be um, that the product is effective. Because what we'll find is that a lot of the products on the market don't work. And acne is such a tricky thing. Some things might work for one person and it might not work for another. And so a lot of persons have that issue. And so that is the most critical um, thing. All right, and now last but certainly not least, we have Redraft. Imagine that you have just recently created your greatest masterpiece. It could be a story, a poem, an essay, or even a business plan. But whatever it is, it is now time for you to type what you have written. So you think to yourself that there must be some software available to make this a lot easier and efficient for me. My name is Brendan Coleman, and we are here to introduce to you a new way to copy and paste. And our story begins with Karim's mom, who is a teacher. Now, Karim's mother always gives him the duty of typing her handwritten notes, her lesson plans. And lesson plans can be very tedious and time consuming. And he shared this pain with me some time ago. And I could relate to it because as a part-time teacher, I had to pay people to type my handwritten lesson plans. And it was very burdensome. And so the question came to mind, what if there was a website that could accurately convert handwritten notes to digital text format. And so the idea of Inscribe came to mind. And the way Inscribe works is that teachers would upload their lesson plans by taking a picture of it. The website would convert this handwritten lesson plan, and then they'd download this document. But first, we needed to test if others were experiencing this pain. So we left the building, and we interviewed 41 teachers face to face. And we hypothesized that teachers needed this website. Now, we discovered that 75% were not interested because the process of conversion was far too tedious. In addition, younger teachers were already typing their lesson plans first anyways. So in one day and with zero dollars, our pain was invalidated. However, we learned so much from our customers because we realized that they had a far greater concern, that is reading illegible, or as we say in Jamaica, crab toe handwriting. So we knew we had to pivot, and we would shift from a website that would convert handwritten lesson plans to an app 
that could digitize any form of handwritten document. So we had a new pane, and now we went to the canvas with a whole new set of assumptions. And we had three crucial assumptions. We hypothesized that we had a monetizable pain. We assumed there was a demand for the product, and we assumed that we could actually build an app of this nature. So we tested our first hypothesis, our first assumption, and we assumed that our customer segments would be persons who took a lot of notes, like students and professionals with large archives of handwritten documents. And we asked them these three basic questions. The result was that 75% took notes religiously. 75% also took notes regularly and said that the process of typing was extremely tedious afterwards. And so we learned that the pain does in fact exist and it was validated. So we went now to the canvas to update it with the information that we validated. So we move now to the second crucial assumption. We assume there was a demand for this product and we wanted to be as lean as possible, so we created an MVP using two simple photographs. The one on the left shows a handwritten letter, and the one on the right is an accurate transcription of that said letter. This took us merely 10 minutes to put together and cost us zero dollars. So we showed this to over 200 persons within our customer segments, and the feedback we got was amazing. 80% loved the idea of this app. But in addition to that, we learned that they wanted an app that can do so much more than just converting their handwritten documents to text. They asked us questions like, will this, document, will this app be able to proofread and edit? Will it be able to share? Will it be able to organize my documents? They even asked us if this app could digitize my drawings, my tables, and for the musicians, my sheet music. So we knew we had to build an app that was customized tailor fit to fit the needs of our customers. So we went again to the canvas and we updated it with our value propositions. Now, we were further validated when we did our own research and we found that there are organizations and universities around the world who are hiring note takers who would provide clear and accurate records as notes for lecturers and, and, and teachers in the classroom. And so we felt very excited when we found this bit of information. Now, we realized that there was, there was a pain. We, we validated that there was a market for our product, but can we build it? So we went to get some expert validation, and we spoke to four programmers in four weeks, and that cost us $600. Two of those programmers, namely Henry Osborne from the Northern Caribbean University and Suzette Wright from ID Maps. Henry Osborne informed us that we were focusing on the wrong market and that we should focus more on the transcription market. Suzette Wright told us and confirmed that OCR was indeed a limitation and that it was indeed possible to build the app that we wanted. So we targeted the transcription market, we validated our key resources, and Suzette Wright became one of our key partners, and she has written a letter that consents that she was willing, after she realizes the potential of this app, that she's willing to partner with us on this project. So we knew the app could be built, so we built a prototype of the user interface. And the way the app works is, you sign in with your credentials, and then you'll get a welcome notification on the first opening of the app. You'll see a photograph of a camera at the bottom. You click it, take your picture, and then the document will be converted to digital text format accurately. Now, we wanted to see just how much customers were interested and we wanted further validation. So we created a website and we asked persons to, sub to subscribe to this so that they would be a part of our waiting list. Now, as soon as the app is launched, they'll be notified of this and they'll be able to download the app, use it for 30, 30 days free trial. Now, in three days and with little to no marketing, we were able to attain a total of 79 subscribers and we were happy for this validation. So we followed through with Henry Osborne's advice, and we looked at the transcription market, and we found that by 2023, the industry is supposed to grow to 78 billion. Now, we were excited when we heard this, and we wanted to learn even more, so we went and did a little bit more research, and we were extremely disappointed, because this transcription industry is largely speech-to-text, and that was not our market. 
So the lesson learned, ensure your experts are clear on your target market. So we had to do a second round of expert validation. And this time we spoke to Bevan King, who is a graduate of MIT. He informed us that we should in fact be in the digitizing market. So we iterated. And when we did our first email subscription list, persons were so excited that they wanted the product now. So we wanted further validation. And so we told them that they should send their documents to our email that we created, myredraft at gmail.com. And we would transcribe it for them and return it to them within 24 hours. We got responses, and they said that our app was 98% accurate. Now, we got 10 pages worth of information, and we charged $100 each. And all of this took place in one night with little to no marketing. Now, we spoke to doctors, and the doctors were excited. They wanted this product, but they wanted a software version of it. So we had to update our value proposition to include this feature. We also knew that they would want data security, so data security would be a key activity alongside product development and testing and patenting. Now, our main product is an app, so our channels for distribution would be the Google Play Store and the App Store. We would use the monthly subscription model and charge $2.99. We arrived at this figure because after conducting several focus groups, we were informed by our customers that they, the price points were 99 cents to $5. So we decided to average and strike right in the middle and charge $2.99. Now, we are using the agile approach in developing this app. And so the cost structure would be $51,000. We would foster customer relationships by free trials, discounts from partners, customer referrals, and etc. Now, we knew we had to have a great revenue model. And so we knew that our pr profit margin after doing the calculations would be $1.99 after we break even at 16,723 downloads. Now, apps are changing the world and they are enriching our lives and enabling people like us to be as innovative as possible. And thanks to the business model, we nailed our value proposition. We spoke to over 79, 795 in persons by way of interviews and surveys. And we nailed our business model and in the process, we created an expert team of developers and advisors. We established product market fit, and in the process, we were able to attain 79 potential customers on a waiting list with little to no programming. With Redraft, digitizing has never been so easy. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Good presentation. Um, a quick question for you. Uh, how exactly did you validate the subscription model versus a one-off payment? We actually held several focus groups. That's a really good question. Thank you. And based on the focus groups, the first three focus groups, they told us that they would prefer a subscription model as they expected that the price would be cheaper. So we chose $2.99 based on their feedback of $0.99 cents to $5. OK. And um, where are you currently with the app development? And what do you think is the time to market? Or how long do you think it will take you to develop the app? Uh, thank you. Um, Currently, we have designed the prototype of the user interface, and we were told by our experts that this app will take up to six months, a maximum of six months, to be launched on the market. Um, have you determined what is your custom acquisition cost? How much would it cost you to acquire a customer? Thank you for that question as well. We also considered this, and since we have actually attained our customers since, um, or through rather, the email and the waiting list, we realized that we could use digital marketing strategy as well as guerrilla marketing to create a lean marketing strategy which would enable us to get more customers. Okay, so because we're using the lean marketing strategy, it would cost us a total of 1,000 US dollars to get our first 16,723 customers. Well done, guys. Um you help us to, to highlight um, a, key, a key lesson to be learned from the pivoting process. We're pivoting based on experts' opinion versus the customer's need. And I noticed you had to pivot and then pivot away again, <laughs> which is very good. Um, I, have, I have a question for you. You had looked at the total addressable market from that, that research it did, but that was what the the translation 
So what's the what's based on the pivot you made? What's the total of addressable market now? Okay, so thank you for that question as well. And we had to really go back and do our research on this, mm -hmm. and we found out that our handwriting recognition market was actually five billion dollars, and we would also have a part of the transcription market, which is speech to text, speech to text rather. Mm -hmm. And we estimated this at about two percent of the seventy-eight billion. That's good. Um, tell me about the validation of your customer relationship um, assumptions. So during our focus groups, after finding out that they were willing to pay between 99 cents and $5, we asked, what do you really want from this app? And they said, firstly, they wanted to know if it works. So they would want some form of free trial or free version, right? They also said, do I get a discount if I allow other persons to sign up and so forth? So we sort um, added the referrals as well as partnership discounts. And where your customer support is concerned, we already have our website domain, and we, we will be using app reviews to enable us to further update our product. Have you considered the impact of your partner discounts on your cost structure and therefore your revenue streams? Yes, we have. And in fact, let us go to our revenue projections. We have actually validated this, and we worked out our total sales. And as you can see here, I'll allow my partner to explain this further. Okay, so we have our total sales in blue. In red, we have the amount of the money from the total sales that will go back into the development of the app and the maintenance of it. And the green is the profit margin that we'll gain each year. And as you can see, um, based on the amount of subscribers that we project to have each month, then this is the model that we use, and it will continue to grow. Um, and you can, as you can see, in year three, the total sales will increase, so will the development of the app and the profit margin will, will um, increase as well. Okay, so since this is a, a summary table, I can't see the details, but the, you talk about the red bar being the cost to, to develop the app. Um, do you include estimates of other costs, whether administrative, um, human resources, that yes. kind of cost? It's this, the, the red is for app development and maintenance, so it will also include the the data security and all of those other um, aspects that involves the maintenance of the app. Um, can you tell me what, um, how you see your app as differentiated versus what is already on the market? And um, would it be, uh, when you actually get the output from the app, is it something that, for example, I could you know, search or I could um, save and print or, or something like that? How, how, what's, what's all of that? Okay, so to answer the first part of the question, we actually have, and we are, I would say, yes, we are quite different from our competitors, as all our competitors focus on handwriting recognition, mm -hmm. where we also would do tables, graphics, pictures, and illustrations. Mm -hmm. We also beat them where pricing is concerned, as they price from $7.99 up to $49, and based on our feedback, we chose the $2.99 model. Um, essentially, uh, the output of the app, right? Um, is it something that I could search? Okay. Um, is it searchable? Um, can I print the output, that kind of thing? Okay. All right, thank you. So based on our customer feedback, they told us that they wanted to be able to share it with friends. For example, if they friend misses a class, they would want to share the notes. They also told us that they wanted to be able to save. And for graphic designers and so forth, they would want different saving options for different picture formats. So we also added that. You are also able to export it. So therefore, you'd be able to print in whatever format you wish. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say job well done to all the teams. And of course, special thanks again to all our partners, IDB Lab, Panjam Investment, NCB Foundation, GK Capital Management, The Musson Foundation, Scotiabank, Burger King, Sagicor Group, and of course, Petro Carib Development Fund. Now, we know that the judges have some work to do. I hear that Jay Jacent is the favorite, and that's who Jacent, sorry, 
and that's who they're they're pulling for so no pressure judges you know no pressure at all you just do what you need to do we're gonna break now for lunch the judges are gonna go and deliberate and we're gonna reconvene at 2 p.m and we will have a winner for you at that time